I have been building technology, which means we're building an app that allows you to book beauty treatment based on pictures. So if any of you have a picture of a footballer and you're like, I want my hair cut like his, or if you have nails from a magazine and you're like, I want my nails like that, um, I'm building technology that allows you to take that picture and book it. And building tech is very complicated and very hard. And it's even harder when you're not in an office because of lockdown. So yeah, it's been challenging, but entertaining. Who is, who is the most popular celebrity that you've had people say, I want to look like? Ooh. Um, at the height of nails, everybody wanted nails like Rihanna or Lady Gaga because she would always have crazy nails. And people, whenever she won a Grammy award or a music award, the next day, everybody would come in and want the exact nails that she held the trophy with, you know? They would be like zooming in being like, I want those nails. So yeah, Lady Gaga probably. And, and, and would I be right in saying this sounds a little bit like Shazam almost, but for like styling myself up? If I decide I want to look like Walter, I can almost like take a picture of him and say, yeah, I really want to look like Walter. <laughs> I would say it's a bit more like Pinterest. So if you guys think about Pinterest or Instagram as being like a black hole of images, you could just be scrolling and scrolling and looking at all of these pictures, but you can't actually get any of those pictures done because you don't know who did them. So what I'm trying to do is make it less about liking and screenshotting and more about booking and having stuff done. Excellent. Sounds like an amazing, amazing business. Sharmini, you've done a hell of a lot already. You're very, very young to be as successful as you are. Perhaps we could go back a bit and start in your childhood and kind of your teen years. What was that like and how has it kind of influenced the person, the businesswoman you've become? Well, in case you can't hear, I'm from Wolverhampton. I have a West Midlands accent. So I was raised um, in Wolverhampton. I was lucky enough to go to schools which made me be incredibly curious and inquisitive. Um, the senior school I went to was actually an experiment. It was the government said, okay, here's, there's 10 schools and you're allowed to do what you want. And actually you can teach anything you want and you can operate it however you want. And back in the nineties, um, that was crazy. So my school guys, you, we had registration at all said you had a plastic swipe card a bit like a credit card and you had to wear it on a badge and every time you entered the door you had to swipe in and if you didn't swipe in they knew you were late so we had no bells no detention no registration we had all of our lessons lasted three hours long so you'd have only two lessons a day for three hours um i did business studies from age 11 right from year seven all the way to year to you know year five uh sorry 11 okay. and um every single child had a laptop so every kid had a z88 vintage cambridge laptop and you had to write your own school reports so the teachers would write a little sentence in the front of your book and you would have to type it into a spreadsheet and i was doing that from age 11 and i'm 36 next week is my birthday so if you can imagine in the 90s, this was all very innovative, but it helped me think about technology and business from a very, very young age. It made me think, well, how does technology make a system more efficient or how does business, um, you know, help create the society that we live in today? I remember my very first business lesson, age 11, we had to make paper chains, you know, like um, spiral paper chains that you hang from the ceiling. And one table had to make them like one by one. Another table had to do them in an assembly line. And it was all about production methods. And that was my first ever business lesson, efficiency. It, it sounds like you had a pretty happy childhood. We, we, ask, um, we ask everyone this who comes on the show. The average listener is about 12 on the show. Is there anything that you would tell your 12-year-old self now that you know or that you do? Um... So my school was called Thomas Telford, and at the time I absolutely hated it. I thought it was oppressive, strict, so much authority and rules, and I was so against all of these rules. 
But my advice to any 12 year old is to make the best of the situation that you have, particularly in the time we're living in now. I'm sure that you guys are bored, you miss your friends, um, you know, being with your parents all day isn't that much fun. <laughs> so what I learned from being 12 and being in this crazy school is that actually I have an opportunity here to do things that nobody else has ever done. Not, not from my family anyway, before. So I think that all the 12 year olds on this call should be like, coronavirus is very trying, but actually that you have so much opportunity and time in front of you to explore, to learn things that you didn't, you know, have opportunities to do. So yeah, make the best of what you've got. Bang on. And, it, it, and if, if Henry or I say that, no one listens, but coming from you, that's an extremely positive message to hear. So thank you for sharing that. Can I ask, setting up your business, if we move forward a bit, what have been the hardest things? Everyone experiences different trouble with in the business world. What have been your big obstacles that you've overcome? The hardest thing is doing something completely brand new and out of your comfort zone. It's very easy to say, I was actually a fashion stylist before, before I did this. So, and I was really good at it and it was very easy and it was literally people paid me to do things that I loved. In fact, you'll like this, but one of my early jobs when I was pregnant with Roman, who's an Oppidan attendee, is uh, I did the French football kit. So I styled the whole French football team in Nike football kit while I was like heavily pregnant and it was like amazing and we were in France and it was really fun. Um, but I was good at it and it was easy. But starting a business forces you to do things that are so hard that it's very easy to just say, I don't like this anymore. I'm over it. Um, so persevering is probably the thing that I've learned because everything is hard. There is no one thing that's hard when you start a business. Everything is from getting your first customer is hard to make, you know, building really good relationships with your customers to managing a team and hiring and it feels relentless, but it is so rewarding. But you have to be incredibly resilient and have a lot of perseverance. So when you, I mean, um, after that work at Nike, you were featured in an article in 2008, I think, that basically said you were, you were one of the 15 future stars that were going to define the future of arts in Britain. Um, how has arts changed in those intervening 12 years, do you think? Has it changed a lot since you worked at Nike? Do you know what I think has changed massively is the ability for um, people who wouldn't have thought that they could have started a business similar to mine, like would have seen my journey and, and have tried it. So when I started my business, I was 24 years old and none of my friends owned their own shops. None of them owned spades. None of them had like very strong feminist branding or statements, colour palette. There was so much about what we did at WA 10 years ago um, that changed how girls would open businesses. So, you know, whether it was a bakery or a plant shop or whatever they opened, the attitude with which they opened that business would have definitely been inspired by the work we did at WA. And that's the thing that actually makes me the proudest. And while it was a magazine initially, and then it was a, a nail salon, well, a, a collection of nail salons. Yeah, so this is actually a good tip for any of the um, children on the call, which is I started my business when I was at school. I did a side project, which wasn't anything to do with my schoolwork. I made a magazine. I photocopied it using the university photocopier. Um, I went to Central St. Martin's and it was all very relaxed and art schooly. but I made a magazine and then I stapled it together. And then anytime I was out, I would just give people the magazine for free. And it turned out that that magazine became so popular. I, it became a salon because all the girls wanted to hang out who read the magazine. And then that salon gave me the idea to start a technology company. So you never know which one of your fun little side projects will become your entire career. So try everything out. So was there like a, a light bulb moment at some point or was it a, a series of light bulbs that have led along the way to very different things? There wasn't a light bulb moment because I'm, I still, for a long time, I suppressed the success 
of the thing that people wanted. So as I mentioned before, I used to be a fashion stylist and it was so much fun flying all over the world, flying business class for like going to Seattle for three days and flying back and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I loved it. But the nail salon and my styling career were happening at the same time. And there was no light bulb moment. I just made this salon because I wanted a cool hangout spot. I wanted almost like a clubhouse for me and my girlfriends, but I didn't think it would be a business. So it grew and grew and grew. And I wasn't really enjoying it because I was having fun over here. And then the light bulb moment was more like a crash when I couldn't handle doing two things at once and I had to make a decision. And the decision I made was to follow the um, salon business because I knew it gave so many people so much joy and like, it was just, people loved it. Um, so yeah, it was more like I was pulled into it than it was like a light bulb moment. Nice. We're gonna, um, there's lots of questions rolling in and we're gonna get to those. They all wanna know about your life, which is awesome. We're going to get onto beauty sack as well in a second but and i'm not stalking you i promise but there was a blog post you wrote about four years ago yeah. and in it you said i've never had a mentor and trust me i've made mistakes and that yeah. line kind of jumped at me because we're a mentoring company we advocate that all people kids adults should have a mentor i guess my question and i don't know what the answer is is do you wish you had a mentor or do you think you need to make those mistakes on your own? It's a really good question because I think that um, it's like when you tell someone, when you tell a young person, you know, this is my advice, I think you should do this, that person really needs to feel the mistakes firsthand. And I feel like there's a fine balance between things that could be avoided and things where you need to feel it to understand it. I had a really good, I've had some incredible female bosses in my time. I haven't had a proper job ever in my life, but in all of my kind of small jobs while I was a student, I always had great female bosses. And um, when I was consulting at Nike, my female um, account manager, I had an idea for a project that I really wanted to do. And I ran off and did all the research for this project and got all the things together. And she said to me, she let me do it. She didn't say anything. She mentored me silently. And then when I presented it and I said, this project will never work. She said, I knew it wouldn't work from the minute you started doing it, but I had to let you do it yourself because otherwise you would have um, resented me and called me like, you know, authoritarian or whatever. So I feel like there's a balance to be had, but I definitely am always actively looking for older and experienced people who can share their words of wisdom with me while giving me the space and freedom to make those mistakes myself. I think if those mistakes are things that you can recover quickly from, um, that's when you should have the freedom to do it. But then there are some things that to me are non-negotiable. So it's such a fine balancing act, but definitely it's, listen. It's such, a, it's such a good answer that, you know, we've been talking about mentoring for four years, but that like, that balance is exactly what it's all about, isn't it? Luckily, we've got this call on record, Walter, so we can use <laughs> it in our, in our Thursday morning meeting. As, as your mentoring advice, Charmaine. So, I mean, I'm sure you've had um, mistakes made along the way, but you've had a great deal of success too. We've asked a lot of people this about defining success and like at what point you have become a success. I'm sure you don't feel as successful as we perhaps from the outside see you as. Uh, how do you kind of define success in the years ahead for you? I think this is a difficult question because if you're entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial or ambitious or driven you will never feel successful because the minute you feel satisfied you stop moving like I actually fear having my ambitions realized because then what will I do I might as well go to the countryside and raise chickens because <laughs> I just like I will lose the drive so for me I have a personal value system and I've made I write these epic narratives of what my life will look like in 10 years. So they're not goals. It's more like a story. 
And if the story of my life has come to fruition in 10 years, then to me, I'll have been deemed successful. But the things in that story are not monetary value or like things I've acquired or have. It's like, you know, I have a really close, loyal circle of friends that I see very regularly or um, I feel heard and understood. That's really important for me. Or, you know, I'm often of service to people rather than in a consumption mode. So my, my definition of success is quite layered and complex and based on a personal reason that defined. Sorry, that was very long winded. <laughs> it's super very, cool. I love the idea. But you get it. Yeah. Can I ask a, a gossip? Not a gossip. Frozen. Oh, back. Yeah. Uh, can I ask not a gossipy question, but there's lots of people out there who are keen on fashion, boys and girls who are keen to go into big brands and stuff. You've obviously worked a lot with uh, brands like Selfridges and Topshop and so on is there an undercurrent of um i don't know what is the undercurrent like when you're working with those big brands is it quite cutthroat is there any advice you would give youngsters coming through trying to work with those big brands because that must be terrifying to start i think what's beautiful about the era that we live in now is that young people like from millennials and Gen Z to your network, which is Generation Alpha, I've heard it be called, um, they are defining the workplaces that they want to exist in. And the young people today have so much power to say, this is how I want to work and this is what's important to me. So I don't think those environments will continue or be cutthroat because they just won't get the best talent. So I think, you know, the children, the Opida network and the children on this call should know that they have so much autonomy in defining the ways that they want to work and they will find the right company for them. So in fashion and beauty, if there's a fashion company that are, you know, poor working hours, don't let you see your family, don't give good maternity leave, don't want to pay interns properly, you can literally just say no because there'll be another company that serves your values. So yeah don't stand for any poor working practices in life. Well, that, that comes on to, to, to my last big question and then we're gonna to get to our quick fire round and, and, and play a stupid game at the end. But um, uh, I love your out of office, which is for those who don't know, it's, it's an email that is automatic and it replies to emails. And it, it just for me encompasses exactly what you're like and the business that you represent and stuff. Um, is that, is what my question is very simply, what areas of business is it absolutely vital to get right? Because we have lots of people who want to start their own businesses. Is it the brand? Is it the work perks? Is it the maternity leave? Is it the narrative? Is it getting data? Is it the customer journey? What, what for you is like the thing to get right if you had to choose one thing? If I had to choose only one thing that I think everybody should nail, it's user personas. And what I mean by that is having such a strong detailed understanding of who your customers are because you should be able to predict what they want and why they want it and when they're going to want it before they even know it and the only way to do that is by in-depth research about them so i don't mean demographics i don't mean um you know 20 percent of our audience live in notting hill <laughs> Or, you know, most of the families who come to us have three children. It's, it's more detailed and it would be like your customer. Firstly, you might have a customer that's the child. You, you're selling to the child. And then you have a customer that's the parent. Um, and then in the parent, it might be like three different subsets of parents. And it might be that one parent feels very guilty that her childhood was not full of activities and actually her parents were really boring and they never took them on trips or on camping. So she feels like that she has to do so many activities. That kid has to do so many extracurricular work, read all the books, do all the things because that mum, I am talking about me, uh, feels like they didn't have the childhood that they want to give their child. Now that is something that doesn't appear on a marketing survey. That's something that doesn't appear on a demographics report. So if you build these user personas and you understand your customers in such detail, you can really tailor your service to them because the brand, the service, the value proposition all falls in line after you understand the customer. 
sage advice. Very sage advice. I think it's time for a little quick fire round. We've got a few questions that have come in on here mixed with a couple of our own. I'm going to start us off, which is if you hadn't come across any of the careers you were doing now or had done in the past, what would you be? If I could do anything. Well, yeah. What would you be most suited to? What do you think you would have ended up doing if you hadn't started a business? There's so many jobs, guys. So many. I would love to be a film director. I'd love to be a writer. I'd love to make documentaries. I'd like to paint. I'd like to live, like I said, in the countryside. I'd love to have my own farm, a goat farm. I'd love to raise goats. Um, I'd like to do loads of careers. I'd love to be a politician. I'd like to be a policymaker. Um, yeah. Well, there's still time for plenty of those. You're not going to get... You're not going to get quick fire out of me because I want too many things. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> maybe, and maybe this is also not a quick fire question, but in the, in the, in the narrative and the move and the, the big empowerment, the movement of empowering women, what is the big annoyance that you find crops up? In the movement of empowering women, I find it very strange that people do not consider childcare as the most critical thing for gender equality. Um, unless you have childcare split equally in the home, how on earth can a woman that think of the next, be the next Shakespeare or think of the next great algorithm or do all of these things if that person's brain space is constantly thinking about pat lunches and holidays and all of these things that women end up having to think about because the domestic cognitive load is on them. My massive thing is sort childcare out and everything else falls into place. I spent the first five years of my life thinking about is Roman okay? Is he okay with the childcare or at nursery? So yeah. We've got a question from Max and Leo I want to take, which is greatest inspiration in fashion. Ooh, greatest inspiration in fashion. I am inspired by a duality of styles. I am very English, but I'm also very Jamaican. I am very like hip hop, but I'm also very English eccentric. And I like mix I like the duality of the life that I live and I like being like a city and a country person and high and low I like wearing a Prada bag with Nike trainers and I like doing all of these things that mash styles together and I think that's the coolest thing about English style is English people have a bricolage of things going on so I don't have a single style inspiration but I love mashing up styles to make it my own I think that duality is like a really good bit of advice for anyone, actually. Paint yourself thin. Don't pigeonhole yourself into one, yeah. one corner. Yeah. One like, more. This necklace is like a hip hop, you know, like a football, an American football um, thing. And me and my best friends from all over the world, we have this, but I've got it on a string of real pearls, like tiny little ones. That sums up the duality of what's going on here, you know? I've just got, I've got my girlfriend in the next room who's just messaged on the thing saying, I'm obsessed. And I know there's hundreds of questions I'm going to get. So uh, let's leave it there. And, and we can, I'll email you afterwards or something. But um, uh, we have a 30 second game that we always play. This is Biscuit Face. If you've got the brief, I don't know if you've got a biscuit with you. Or maybe you could go to get biscuit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whilst you... I literally don't have any snacks in the house. I or, will... a, or, or a, I don't know, what else can you use instead of a biscuit? Maybe a little Rivita or a... a... <laughs> Anything small. And while you're waiting out there, guys, uh, get your biscuit ready. I've got an Oreo today. As you can see on the, my camera, actually, I'm slightly sweating because it's so steamy in here today. So if the Oreo gets stuck to my forehead, Sharmadine, all you have to do is get whatever your chosen item is. Yeah, I'd split it in half, even smaller. And you've got to get it from your forehead to your mouth without using your hands, trying to like lean it in. My advice is not much speed at the top, otherwise you'll lose it. You've got 30 seconds. And you're fine. <laughs> this so yeah I, you can start, yeah <laughs> yeah you do well you do well okay we're gonna start we're gonna start now yeah. so 30 seconds we're on it have you got your biscuit and you're gonna go Two, one i'll go for it as well go i'm gonna have a go <laughs> those at home oh you get another go <laughs> this is so hard 
feel like I'm having a weird spasm. Henry is equally funny, oh, equally difficult. I'm so close. I'm so close. Did you do you've it? Great job. You've done a great job. <laughs> this is so hard. Normandy, what you want to do when you're alone and having dinner later, you just say to him, how did you do a biscuit face? Because I know he played it, the other day because he was messaging us on the thing saying, I don't have a biscuit. Mum doesn't have any biscuits at home. And then he tried with something else. So I'm afraid there's going to be a cross for you on the top of the leaderboard of biscuit face. So, so I'm really sorry about that. Oh, no. how, a valiant, how do people actually do that? I think it's all about choice of biscuit. We had one wily, wily bloke who did it in five and a half seconds with a hobnob. Unbelievable. Oh, a hobnob's got grip. That's yeah, I think why. it also depends. It's got Sometimes texture, people, hasn't it? I think facial hair can help. It all depends on the shape of the face and everything. It's very Charmaine, I'm, I'm going to leave you with one thing. Uh, you're super um, inspirational and uh, thank you for coming on the show. Rupert has just uh, finished saying, how are you so nice? And what a nice way to finish. How are you so nice? So there we go. Um, thank you for being on the show. We're really, really grateful. Thank you. I ha we haven't had anyone who's spoken so purposefully and I think with words that were so relevant for the kids listening. So thank you. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. No See worries. You should I leave now? You can yeah. leave. I'll remove you. Bye, Charles. Bye. See Bye. you.